special welcome to any first time guests we have today. I met a number of you at the door. It's really good to see you too and welcome. If, you're, if this is your second or third time as a guest with us, welcome back. As we prepare to worship our Lord this morning, let me share with you from Psalms 100. Shout with the Lord, shout with joy to the Lord. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him singing with joy. Acknowledge that he is God. He made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into the courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever. His faithfulness continues generation. Let's pray together this morning. Father in heaven, so magnificent and holy is your name. Father, we praise you for each and every person that came here this morning. We've come before you to worship in truth and in spirit. Father, thank you for watching over us as you are the great shepherd and we truly are your sheep. Father, for the gift of salvation and the opportunity to spend eternity in your presence because of Christ's sacrifice on the cross, we really thank you. Now we ask that our worship this day may be acceptable and pleasing unto you. Pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Blessed be your name, the land that is plentiful, the streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name, when I'm found in the desert place.
67. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the people praise you, O oh God. May all the people praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy. For your role, the people justly and guide the nations of the earth. May the people praise you, O oh God. May all the people praise you. Then the land will yield its harvest. And God, our God, will bless us. God will bless us. And all the ends of the earth will fear him.
We celebrate at this time each week. We've already begun to celebrate. We celebrate through song. We worship. We celebrate and worship through the word, which we'll do in just a minute. But right now, we're going to celebrate, as we do each week, each time we're together, with the Lord's Supper. All of us learn very young, very early in our life, to celebrate. We celebrate birthdays. We learn how to celebrate holidays. We got a little older, and we began to find out all of our friends don't celebrate the same way we do. You know, at their house, they do it this way. At our house, we do it this way. We celebrate the same thing, but maybe a little different. As we got older, I mean, we got married, we began to celebrate wedding anniversaries. <clears throat> and they take on some similarity. Gail and I have had the blessing to celebrate 50 of them so far, and there's some similarity between them. As I said in the first service, that just means we're old. <laughs> but it doesn't. It means a lot more than that. We'll, we'll talk about that some other time. Uh, you know, when you celebrate wedding anniversaries, there's usually flowers involved. Maybe some friends, close friends that you want to celebrate with you. A nice restaurant, good meal perhaps. Or maybe you just pack up and head off for a B&B for the weekend, something like that. We've done all of those things. Suppose with me for just a moment that we, we decided to change that a little bit. Gail and I got married on the 14th of the month. Well, suppose we decided that we like this so much, we're going to celebrate the 14th of every month. Well, you know what's going to happen. Those friends that we invite, they're going to start fading a little bit. Maybe not to the restaurant, or I forgot the flowers, or whatever. But we're committed to this, and we really think it's important. Now, when we got married, the 14th was a Saturday. So now we decide we're going to celebrate our wedding anniversary every Saturday. <laughs> The guys are growing in for sure. <laughs> but you know what that's going to look like. After a while, that's going to be, you know, waving across the room at each other while you're watching a football game. It's not going to, it's not going to be the same. Now, I've been in churches that celebrate the Lord's Supper once a quarter. I've been in some that celebrate once a month. I have to tell you, this is the first body that I've been a part of that celebrates every week. I think that's cool. But there is some, some danger in that, if you will. And that's my, my purpose today is to issue a little bit of a challenge to you, perhaps a warning, but a challenge to you. To not let our celebration of the greatest gift ever given and received in the history of history. To let, don't let that become just something we do between singing and preaching. And it can be. It can become that because we do it so often. Well, why do we do it so often? Because it's important. Because of all the things that we might ever celebrate in our life, we can't possibly celebrate anything more glorious than that. It's the best gift we could ever be given. God gave his son that he would die for our sins. What a great gift. And the Bible doesn't tell us that we need to do it every week or every month or every quarter. We choose to do that. How we do it is really what would be of interest to us. Because if we let it be that wave across the room, we miss it. Then we're not celebrating. And you know, nowhere in the Bible does it say that when you take the Lord's Supper, that it's time for sackcloth and ashes. That you've got to frown. You've got to be serious. 
You got to put on that holy face you got. Don't look at me like that. You all got one. <laughs> celebration. How do you celebrate? Normally with joy. The psalm that Mike read to us a while ago. A joyous countenance. That joy should be in our heart. It should be on our face. And so my first challenge to you today is don't let it become rote. Don't let it become just something that we do. And as, as, you, as you contemplate, we always have a time before we actually take the elements. Spend that time thinking about what God has done for you and celebrating that. And it would be so cool for me to stand up here and while you're doing that, see big smiles on people's faces. And it, and, and it really should be because that's how we should feel about what God has done for us. Now here at CFCC, we practice what's called open communion. What that means is you don't have to be a member of this body, this church, to take communion with us. You do, however, need to be a, a member of the kingdom. So if anybody is welcome to take communion here who has acknowledged Jesus Christ as their Lord and publicly acknowledged them as their Savior. If that's not you right now, just let the plate pass by. No problem with that at all. But if it's not you, we hope that by the next time we do this, you'll be able to participate with us, that you've accepted Jesus into your heart. So as the men come forward to distribute the elements, please hold them until everybody has been served, and then we'll take them as a family. There are two cups. Be sure and get both of them.
We thank you for this place. We thank you for this opportunity. May we always be joyous in celebration of what it is that you've done for us and the opportunity that you've given us to spend eternity with you. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. that every week, no matter where we put communion in the order, it never becomes a functional thing and something we just do as a, as a habit. We do get to celebrate what God has done for us, and we wouldn't even be here. This wouldn't even be a thing we would be doing if it wouldn't have been for what Jesus Christ did 2,000 years ago on a cross, and more importantly, with an empty tomb. So yes, thanks for the reminder. Um, you know, first service was funny. I was noticing how the people were kind of gathered over on this side and over on this side, and there was a big kind of a hole in the middle. You guys are a little more spread out, except I noticed nobody really likes the front rows around here. So the challenge next week is to hit the front rows. I'm just kidding. So let's play a little name association. Has anybody here ever been uh, had a sibling or a parent or even a child or a best friend that was really super talented at something, really good at something, and because you were their friend, whenever they said, like, maybe your name, it was associated with the person that uh, was really talented. Anybody have, like, a sibling that was really good at something? Yeah, anybody? No? Okay, you were always the good ones. Okay, that's fair. <laughs> but so the, oftentimes we can be associated with those around us simply by name, right? So let me give you a couple for instances. If I were to say the name Little Joe Cartwright, what would you say? Oh, Hoss. Hoss, right? Okay, so you guys have got the theory that the bigger brother, right? What if I were to say the name Robin? Who would you say? Batman, Batman okay, the superhero. <laughs> what if I were to say uh, Tonto? Oh, Ranger. Ranger, okay, you guys are getting the hang of this. This is kind of what uh, is where we're studying today. A guy by the name of Isaac, who when I say Isaac, you probably think of a lot of other names, right? Maybe even Abraham. Abraham is, the scriptures are loaded with things he did in acts of faith, right? Faith is what we're studying. Uh, the, maybe the dad that was the more prolific hero of faith, if you will. Maybe even Jacob, his son. So if I were to say this, this name, Florida State Seminoles, what would you say? Florida Gators, there you go. You're, we're all getting hands. I don't throw anything at me. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but this is kind of a tricky story today because when I looked at Isaac's name in the Bible, there's really not a lot about him that's remarkable. He, you might actually describe him as a very unremarkable person. Like I said, you probably, when I say his name, you probably think Abraham or Jacob or Esau or even Rebecca. His wife is probably, uh, maybe uh, was more influential on in the family than even he was. So, in the Hall of Fame, in uh, chapter 11 of Hebrews, which, which is what we've been studying, with the intent of going back and looking at the characters of old, with the purpose of seeing what they did with what they believed. Faith, right? Faith is an action word. It means you do something with what you believe, right? <clears throat> and what's mentioned about Isaac, which is what led me to this thought, was it simply says, by faith, uh, verse 20 of chapter 11 of Hebrews, by faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau. And you might stop right there and think, so what? Every dad does that. 
That's not nothing that required faith. But the second half of this verse is what caused me to go back and study. It says this, Bless Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. Now that's a big statement because it was very common for the dad, the patriarch of the family, as he was getting ready to die, to gather up the boys, specifically the oldest male boy, which usually got the lion's share of the inheritance and the blessing, if you will, got the, the birthright. Um, that was very common, but he spoke something into the future of these young men, almost as if God himself spoke through Isaac as he blessed his boys regarding their future. So don't miss the second half of that, that, that uh, verse there, in regard to their future. And so it got me thinking, I really needed to go back and set the stage with what, what's happening here. Before we get into the blessing, let's take a look at the birth, right? So if, you're with, if you have your Bibles with me, with you and with me, go back to the 25th chapter of the book of Genesis. Once again, there's not a lot about Isaac that screams faith. Except there's a couple of things that happen right up front here I want to bring, bring to, to notice here. If you guys have your Bibles, I will have the words on the screen as well. But chapter 25 of Genesis, let's just start in verse 21. Let's look at the birth of these kids uh, that would get these blessings. But it starts like this. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife. Now you might stop right there and say, that's an act of faith. I'm assuming you all pray, and if, if you don't, uh, you need to enjoy that. That's another celebration that God allows us to have because of Jesus. We get to pray right to God. We don't need an intercessor or anybody in between, a medium or any of that. We get to talk right to God. And you might say this is an act of faith. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife. I know for sure I'm standing in a, in a room full of a body of people that believe and pray for each other. We do it very often. We pray here after service. We, there's a lot of prayer that happens right in here. There's prayer that starts tomorrow when the elders get together. There's a prayer team that meets here on Tuesday morning that pray for you and the, this building and everything that's going on around here. We believe in lifting each other up in prayer. And by the way, prayer is not you saying a bunch of words to God because he already knows what you're going to say, doesn't he? He knows what's on your heart. Prayer is a two-way communication with God. Oftentimes I find myself in prayer with God and I'll ask God something to reveal himself to, to, to me in a way. And then I just shut up. And I let God minister in my spirit. Mm -hmm. Chances are if you've received a text or a phone call from me, it's because I spent time with God and God puts your name or your face on my heart. And I know that you guys do that same thing. It's called talking with God and not to him all the time for sure. And I know that I am full, a room full of people who do this on occasion, right? Let God minister to your spirit. In fact, oftentimes what he does is he actually drives me to his word when I talk to God. When I seek his face, he brings me right to his word where truth is. Because we live in a world full of lies, right? So I actually commend Isaac for this more than anything. Going to the Lord on behalf of his wife because it says she was childless. The funny thing about this is... How long were they childless? Obviously, it burdened Isaac enough to say, let's go try God, which means for a while, they hadn't even thought to introduce God into the program, right? God is still in charge of childbirth. I don't know if you know that or not in this country, but he's still in charge of childbirth. And, you know, I don't know what took them so long to get to talk to God about this, but immediately, it says the Lord answered his prayer and his wife, Rebecca, became pregnant. Almost like, what took you so long? Mm -hmm. Ask me and I'll provide too many times I think we don't ask God, we don't get in front of God and just give him our request. It doesn't mean he answers it yes all the time right away. He knows what's best for us. But why wait so long to get God in, into the equation, right? Let's go to him first from now on. Verse 22 says, we kind of talked about this last week when we looked at Jacob's life. It says, the babies jostled each other within her. And she said, why is this happening to me? So she inquired, went to inquire of the Lord. Once again, what's happening in your world? If you don't understand something in your world, why not try God? Like ask him, inquire of him. What God says to her is something powerful. And I think if you just read through this too quickly, you miss the point of this. You see, God, the Lord said to her in verse 23, two nations are in your room and two peoples from within you will be separated. Right? And we know that's what happens down the road. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older, listen to this, 
the older will serve the younger. Now, we've studied this in backwards, right? We started with Abraham, and then we went with Joseph, Jacob, and then now into Isaac. So we've studied this backwards, so we know what happens. That this, be, this becomes uh, truth. But what are the chances that Rebecca does not share this with her husband? This is what I, this is what I, if you just read this fast, and you, you just read it as a factual thing, you miss the dynamics of this. Has God ever spoken to you? He has me. Just like, I, just like I mentioned a minute ago, oftentimes he'll put a face on my heart or he'll drive me to scripture. It doesn't mean he booms a voice from the clouds or, or however he spoke to Rebecca here. I'm not even sure how he necessarily spoke to her. But I will tell you one thing. The times that God has revealed something to me, guess what? Somebody hears about it. I don't keep that quiet. I send the text or I call somebody or I check in on you on Sunday. Or I go to God's word. But you know what I do all the time? And God reveals something to me so true that I know it's true from God. I tell my wife. Like we talk about it. What are the chances that Rebecca does not share this with Isaac? I would say slim to none. Now, I can't prove that scripturally. Maybe she held on to it. But very, it's a very good possibility that they talk about this over breakfast, right? Maybe it came up that, you know, your younger son will roll over an older one during coffee. Probably. So I don't know if Isaac takes this news well or not, or maybe he doesn't take it, but let's read on. Verse 24 says this, when the time game came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in the womb. We kind of touched on this last week. The first to come out was red and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau, a hairy garment. I'd like to be known as that your whole life. <laughs> Better than the next name. Verse 26, after this, this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob, which means he grasps at the heel or deceiver. A deceiver. How'd you like that name growing up? I wouldn't. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebecca gave birth. Now let's move down to verse 27. This, this is another one of those two. Where I want you to read this slow. And as we read the rest of this today, we're going to jump to the blessing and then paint yourself into the picture. Put yourself in the story. Pretend you're a fly on the wall, or better yet, maybe even pretend like you're one of the characters. But this is a very important thing. You, you've got to remember we're in a culture and a time where the oldest boy gets all the stuff, right? He gets the lion's share of the inheritance, the blessing, the birthright. And now listen to what happens. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, a man's man, right? You, you, you'd probably say, Dad would be proud of this boy. He's a big, hairy man. He's a skillful hunter, right? Proud of his guy. Well, Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. You might think maybe he's a little bit more of a mama's boy, right? And, and maybe rightfully so, but I didn't actually read further into this. I think Jacob was a thinker. I think he was really a thinker, really thought about things in life. Um, but however, uh, you can read on, it says, verse 28, Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Esau. Jacob. So you can see the way to Isaac's heart is through his stomach, right? And his big, strong, hairy boy is a provider of things he likes. Well, uh, mom favored Jacob a little bit more. Now, I don't say, I don't read this to say that dad only loved one and mom only loved one. I read it to say that the characteristics were more like each other. Anybody have multiple kids? And when you have multiple, I'm looking at some that have multiple, multiple kids. But you probably had some that had you, your characteristics that were more closely related to you. Maybe their spiritual gifting was more like yours. Maybe their skill set was like yours, their interests. I had two kids, and my daughter took up volleyball in, in middle school, which was spoke to my heart because I played that for a bunch of years earlier. And so it was real easy for me to go out in the yard and practice and bump the ball around with her. And my son did not take up volleyball, so I had to find ways to go get creative and be with him. But the natural, I had to be careful there because if I wasn't, I could show one kid that I was, I was more pleased with them based on the fact that they like the things that I like. So anyway, you can kind of see this happening here. And parents, we got to be careful of that, right? Just because your kids don't like the things you do doesn't mean we shouldn't get involved with them and try to be a parent. So the kids are growing up. One's staying home in the tent with mom. One's out hunting. Now remember, Rebecca's got this in her mind that there is a prophecy from God that this younger brother will rule over the older one. I'm going to assume she told uh, Isaac, but I'm not sure of that. 
So let's skip over a couple pages to uh, chapter 27. We're going to start in verse 1, and this is the blessing. This is what it all leads to. Now keep in mind, the oldest is supposed to get the stuff, right? He's supposed to get the majority. And that's the guy that is just like dad, and dad loves him. But there's a word of the Lord that comes into play here. We're getting ready to read about a deception that we kind of talked about last week. You know, when God says something's going to happen, it does not mean that it's going to look the way you drew it up. And it does not mean it's not going to happen without trial or trouble or problems. It just means it's going to happen, right? I think sometimes we assume that, that when God reveals something to us that, that we believe we're supposed to be at a place like in this building, right, in this property, that you guys know the story. We, test, we have testimonies about this. We drove by this place scoffing at it a bunch of times, but God's plan is God's plan. God's plan. And we can, I can tell you, it did not look like this when we had our plans drawn in place. But God, right? But God gets to say so. Sometimes, as you can see, with Isaac's dad, Abraham, remember when Abraham sold a hundred-year-old man that you're going to have a child? And they said, okay, and then they pushed God's issue, they pushed the issue of God, right? And, and Sarai, or Sarah, as you know her now, threw a maid servant at Abraham, and they had a child. And so Isaac has a, a decade-plus-year-old sibling because they didn't wait on God's plan. The same thing is going to kind of happen here today. When God said something's going to be true, wait him out. Even if it doesn't look like it, you thought. And so verse 1 here of chapter 27, it says, When Isaac was an old man, and his eyes were so weak that he could no longer see, he called for Esau, his older, older son, and said to him, My son, here I am, he answered. Isaac said, I know now, I, I am now an old man, and don't know the day of my death. Verse 3, Now get your equipment, your quiver and your bow, and go out to the open country and hunt some wild game for me. Prepare me the kind of tasty food I like and bring it to me to eat. So that I may give you my blessing before I die. Once again, I'm not sure what Isaac knows here. I'm not sure if he's been uh, told about this situation by his wife or not. Um, I'm not sure if even the boys know Rebecca's uh, prophecy from the Lord. But he has a plan to immediately bless Esau. But first, go give me some of that taste of game you know I like. Let's have a meal, and I'll give you my blessing. That is the purpose of this. Of course, you guys know, if you, if you know this story at all, mom's listening. She's, she's on the other side of the tent there somewhere, whatever. Here's the story. Sends Jacob out. We're going to read this in a second. But she sends this praise to him, talking to her other son. Now listen carefully and do what I tell you. Almost like you see mom hear something. And knows what the Lord has told her. Where is the faith of Rebecca here to say, let the Lord's plan happen? But she doesn't. She tries to force the issue and she sends her son out to the wolves, if you will, to be in on this deception. This is what happens in verse 9. Skip down there for me. She tells Jacob, go out to the flock and bring me two choice young, choice young goats so that I can prepare some tasty food for your father. Just the way he likes it. Looks like everybody in the house can cook except Isaac. I'm not sure if he doesn't want to do that. <laughs> Verse 10 says, Then take, to, take it to your father to eat, so that he may give you his blessing before he dies. You know, a funny thing happens around death, especially people that die with things, with stuff. And I've seen this more than I uh, care to share, but someone passes away and then there's this big tug of war over their stuff, their junk, right? Or just big battle about, oh, friends come out of the woodworks and family members that never spoke to you now or feel like they're entitled to some of your stuff. And it's kind of a shame, isn't it? Because I don't know about you guys, I, I'm, I'm not in a ready mood to die. Like, I don't want to die right now, but I am so ready to be in the presence of God. And I can tell you one thing. When I get there, I won't care one bit about who's driving my car. When I'm in the presence of Jesus Christ, who's living in my house? And spending the money that God has let me have right now will not come into play. And I promise you, it won't for you either. So the stuff really doesn't matter, does it? When we have eternity to spend in the face of Jesus Christ, even this building won't mean anything to us. But for right now, you've got some people that are fighting over a blessing and stuff. Jacob, I kind of feel bad for because this is his response. He's learning deception from mom and dad. He's already deceived his brother for a birthright. And now he's a little fearful of his plan. So he says this in verse 11. He said to Rebecca, his mother, 
But my brother Esau is a hairy man. Well, I have smooth skin. What if my father touches me? It would appear to be tricking him and would bring down a curse on myself rather than a blessing. He's a little bit nervous about this, isn't he? Well, as you know, mom devises a plan. She puts some animal hair on him and gets, he, she gets his older brother's clothes and puts it on him. So the smell of Esau is on Jacob. So she knows her husband's eyes are no good anymore. So verse 18, he went to his father and said, my father, this is Jacob, with his brother's clothes on and the animal hair all over him. He says, my, he went to his father and said, my father, yes, my son, he answered, who is it? And Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. Sure sounds like it's all about the blessing here, doesn't it? It's all about the stuff. It's all about the birthrights. Where's the love for Isaac almost, right? I mean, I almost kind of feel bad for Isaac in this. Of course, there's a back and forth. You know, Isaac says to his son, you got the voice of Jacob, but, but you got the feel of Esau, right? There's a back and forth in this. And then Isaac throws one last test. Skip down to verse 26. He said, then his father Isaac said to him, Come here, my son, and kiss me. Come close. So when he went to him and kissed him, Isaac caught the smell of his clothes, of his clothes, and he blessed him. Now, when we read this blessing, don't you just kind of soak this in for a minute? These are not words of a guy that has the authority to do all this. You almost can see God Himself speaking through Isaac as He gives this blessing. The one with authority to do these things, and He starts off with this. Oh, the smell of my sons, like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. That the Lord has blessed. And now listen to this, verse 28. May God give you heaven's dew and earth's richness, an abundance of grain and new wine. May nations, hear this, may nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. There it is. This is what Rebecca knew long ago. I'm not even sure Isaac knows exactly what he's saying right here. May those who curse you be cursed, and those who bless you be blessed. Those, sound, those words sound familiar? Those are words God spoke right to his grandfather Abraham, Jacob's. But you see what just happened there. There's the blessing. It's done. It's been out there into existence. And here's where the trickery comes in. Verse 30. As Isaac finished the bless blessing him, and Jacob had scarcely left his father's presence, his brother Esau came in from hunting. He too prepared some tasty food and brought it to his father, and then said to him, My father, please sit up and eat some game. Here you go. So that you may give me your blessing. It's all about this blessing. I kind of feel sorry for Isaac and Esau here in this next scenario, because they realize now... That, it's, that they've been duped, right? There's been a deception by family, nonetheless. Loved family. And there's a back and forth here where I gotta imagine if you put yourself in this scene, you, you've got a, you're, the mercy spirits in this room, I have one, are pouring out all over these two. I feel really bad for them. <clears throat> Verse 32 His father Isaac asked him, Who are you? Imagine that. Who are you? I am your son, he answered, your firstborn, Esau. And now listen to this. Isaac, verse 33, trembled violently. Trembled violently. That does not mean he was upset or he got mad and did a fist bump. That's a violent tremble. He knew what just happened. I believe somewhere right in this, right in this time, Isaac has realized either A, what he knew when his wife told him, or B, God has just revealed to him that this is the right plan. The right son just got the birthright, even though it wasn't your favorite one. Even though it wasn't your plan. Are you willing to go along with God's plan even if it's not the way you drew it up? I'll ask you that. We are living it out. You know, because here's the thing about God's plan. Yes, he does listen to his kids. And yes, we can petition him. But his plan is still his plan. And you have to know it's for our betterment. Regardless if it's the way you were hoping it would be or not. He trembled violently and said, Who is it then that hunted the game and brought it to me? I ate it just before you came and listened to this, and I blessed him, and indeed he will be blessed. The word of the Lord is spoken. Indeed he will be blessed. 
here's my heart pours out for Esau. It says, when he heard his father's words, he burst out with a loud and bitter cry. Once again, this is a, this is a bitter cry here. And he said to his father, bless me. Me too, my father. But he said, your brother came deceitfully and took it your blessing. Took your blessing. Anybody ever here? here anybody here ever had something that was rightfully yours taken from you? Sting's done that. Here's the deal about forgiveness, though. We're going to talk about this in a minute. Uh, that's not an option, right? The Lord God says you'll be forgiven the measure with which you forgive. We, I, I imagine you're sitting in a room full of wounded people, for sure. And I know some of your stories. There's been a lot of wounds shared in this room, not from each other necessarily, but from other people. And here's the deal. You, you've got to still forgive. It doesn't mean you forget. It doesn't mean you put yourself back into situations that are harmful. It just means you don't seek the right punishment for that individual It's on you. Esau doesn't get this yet. He says in verse 36, isn't he rightly named Jacob, deceiver? Isn't, his, isn't that just, just living up to his name, isn't he? This is the second time he's taken advantage of me. He took my birthright and now he's taken my blessing. Then he asked, haven't you reserved any blessings for me? Let's get back to the blessing, right? Yeah, this deceiver guy, but well, what about me? Haven't you reserved anything for me? Isaac answered Esau, I have made him lord over you and made all his relatives his servant, servants, and I have sustained him with grain, with grain and new wine. So what can I possibly do for you, my son? Ouch. 38, Esau said to his father, Do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me too. My father, then Esau, wept aloud again. You see what I'm seeing here? As I, as I see a guy that get, that's getting it wrong. He's, he's concerned about him and what's coming to him. The, the blessing that his dad gives him next is a powerful one. If you just, just let this soak in for a minute. He does kind of have some words for his older son. But it looks like this. In verse 39, his father Isaac answered him. <clears throat> Your dwelling will be away from earth's richness, away from the dew of heaven above. You will live by the sword, and you will serve your brother. But he ends with this. But when you grow restless, when you, you will throw his yoke from off your neck. Wounded people in this room, when you grow restless of that, when you're tired of carrying that yoke of the burden somebody else has given you, you can take that right off. You can give that to Jesus. Amen. Jesus will take your burdens from you. He says that, right, in Matthew 11. Amen. Give me your burden. Come to me who you are weary and burdened. I'll give you rest. Esau one day will get his rest. He does meet up with his brother later down the road, and he gives him forgiveness. He comes up and hugs him, right? At some point, he probably gets tired of this, holding these burdens, even though he was rightfully or wrongfully deceived, excuse me. But forgiveness does happen, doesn't it? He eventually takes that yoke off and forgives. There's got to be a freeing thing about that, isn't it? When you can finally say, I forgive you. You're no longer the one drinking poison and expecting them to die, right? Which is, you know, it's unforgiveness. That's what that is. There's something freeing about saying, I just forgive you. God will handle that situation. Esau learns this. But right now, in this moment, he's getting it wrong. You see, he's looking at his inheritance as a right and not a gift. And those of you who have saved up money or, or stuff or, or, or land or whatever, you're going to leave it to your children. I hope they appreciate it as a gift and not a right. You can do whatever you want with your stuff. And if you've received that from your parents, thank, thank them for the gift. But see, Esau is looking at this as a right. It's my right. I'm the oldest. I'm your favorite. I'm the big hairy hunter just like you wanted, Dad. Where's my stuff? Where's my blessing? Instead of Oh my goodness, I got an inheritance. Thank you. Thank you for whatever you left. I want to fast forward to the book of Galatians real quick. Because it talks about this inheritance type thing that God has blessed us with. And it's in Galatians chapter 3. Right towards the end of that. And I'll have the words up so you don't have to move there. But this is a very powerful section of scripture. And I love this. I love this part of the Bible. Galatians 3, starting verse 26, it says this. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. What we've been studying. In Christ Jesus, 
no other name. In Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. Verse 27, for all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. You know when I hear somebody say things like, well, I'm just a dirty old sinner. Or I'm just a sinner trying to figure out whatever, whatever. It actually bothers me. Because if you've claimed Christ, if you've been baptized into a relationship with him, you've clothed yourself with Christ. When God Almighty smelled the sweet aroma that is you, he smells his son. God Almighty looks at you now through the blood of Jesus Christ as perfect. Because of Jesus, not because of us. Not because of our rights. We didn't have the right to earn salvation. God gave it to us as a gift. Thank you, God. And I agree with what Dave said this morning. We should be celebrating this as often as we possibly can, at least on Sundays with communion. Thank you, God. Thank you so much, Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. He goes on in verse 28. There is neither, listen to this. This is important because every one of you here are saved by the blood of Jesus. Because it looks like this. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. How powerful is that statement? It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter your race. It doesn't matter how rich or poor you are, male or female even. It matters because of Jesus. And God chose you before there was even a first breath of life in Adam's nostrils in the garden. He chose you first. If you belong to Christ, then you are, listen to this, Abraham's seed and heirs. Heirs according to the promise. You see, just like an inheritance is not a right, it's a gift. Salvation is that same thing. It is a gift and not a right. I don't have enough good guy stuff in me to earn salvation. I can promise you that. Some of you have been around me long enough, you know that. And I don't have enough stay away from bad guy things to earn my way to heaven either. But I got a gift. That was a big one. The most impressive gift, the biggest magical gift, as Dave mentioned, in the history of history. Thank you, God. For the gift. And now we all have an inheritance, don't we? Amen. Every one of us have an inheritance because of Jesus. Because of Jesus. Let's pray in that beautiful name, shall we? Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful you picked me. What an honor. I'm so humbled by the gift you've given us, Father. Thank you for this story in the Bible that I've overlooked so many times. Uh, this, this idea of a birthright and did not be so expectant of things, God. You, you placed us carefully in this country for a reason. We're already rich. And then you've put us in neighborhoods like the ones we're in and forget the richness of, of who we are as far as money. But God, what a, what a place you've put, put in us where we can actually do this free on a Sunday morning and talk about your son Jesus and, and celebrate with communion and song and not have to hide to do it. You're so rich, God, but you didn't do that so that we could have a great life. You did it because you have expectations for us. And so when we leave here, God, I ask that you would put a burden on our hearts for the lost. Put a burden that you have, the same burden you have for those who don't know your son's beautiful name yet. Who you don't look at as perfect yet. Because they have not accepted your son as Lord of their life. That is why we exist. And I'm looking, so looking forward to leaving this place and, and drawing someone closer to you today because you did that for me years ago. Thank you so much for your trust, for the keys to the kingdom, God. You have challenged us to make to go make disciples, not not someone else, uh, not not just preachers or church pastors or whatever. Everybody, we're all disciple, we're all disciple makers because you sent someone to us first. And so, put that burden on our heart, God, as we leave this place to draw people close to you. I'm so thankful, God, that you would give us such an inheritance. I can't wait to be with you face to face for eternity, God, but I know until then you've got work for me to do, and so let's go to work. And you promise to do that with us for eternity, that you will never leave or forsake us. What a great promise that is. Thank you for the inheritance, God, once again. It's in Christ's beautiful name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Church, if you have any questions, if you have a need for prayer, please don't be in a rush. You can... Uh, with one of our prayer counselors. You can pray with each other, right? We talk about that all the time. But don't be in a rush. We're going to do a, a last song here uh, where we say goodbye to each other for a few days. So if you want, well, please stand and join us. <laughs>